Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, Falling Walls uh, Roundtable on the future of uh, quantum computing. My name is Frank Wilhelm Mauch. I'm a theoretical physicist at Forschungszentrum Jülich. I'm moderating this panel. I will also occasionally contribute to the panel. Today we are um, talking about quantum computing, which is recognized as a disruptive computing technology that makes uh, solutions to problems accessible that would be inefficient on classical computers. And uh, we are meeting here at a pivotal time for quantum computing. The area is um, expanding a lot. Um, we are going from basic science to engineering and industry. And specifically also in Germany, we are here at the starting point of a national program in quantum computing. And the choice of panelists actually reflects uh, reading representatives of the platforms and demonstrators in this national program in Germany in quantum computing. Um, quantum computing, as it's getting more mature, um, is moving from basic science to engineering. It's also moving to an area of mostly foundational research in universities, to a field where more and more other research organizations, including the private sector, are coming in. And uh, we'll have to, when we move on, uh, work together in these arenas uh, constructively. And um, sometimes, um, next to the science that we have seen, people also emphasize the competition between different areas in the world. We will probably also talk about that. But uh, still, I would uh, like to submit that where we are in quantum computing, humankind has already brought nature to uh, provide rather impressive quantum processors. But the competition in building more, to me, seems to be uh, not between countries and people, but uh, human being against nature uh, to make quantum computers better and better. That was my opening statement as moderator. Now, as a panelist, um, I want to talk to you um, briefly about a project uh, centered at the Forschungszentrum Jülich called Quantum Computing and the Solid State. Um, it is looking at uh, solid state qubits, so uh, integrated circuits operated under cryogenic conditions and controlled by microwaves made out of superconducting materials. We are addressing a full hardware stack and uh, also full software stack. And as we build larger and larger systems, we realize, in fact, that there is no such thing as a hardware project. Any complex engineered technological system is very heavily also driven by software. It will be integrated at our supercomputing center. And if you see where we are, we are clearly centered in the west of Germany and Ernst Jülich, but we also have strong partners in Jena, Karlsruhe, um, and Munich. So our qubits are integrated circuits. And in fact, they are fairly simple. Here you see a little circuit diagram with an inductor, with a capacitor, with a voltage source, and crossed elements. And these are Josephson junctions. These are the counterpart to transistors in the superconducting chip. They are the active elements. There's an old picture from Santa Barbara here, which is an, uh, um, a photograph which shows that these devices are not really small. It's not an electron microscope uh, picture. And you see this array of crosses. These are individual qubits that are addressed by driving lines. Um, and so they're fairly large, they're a couple of micrometers, and they're in a way unique because the degrees of freedom that are used are not single atoms or photons or other elementary particles, but they are collective degrees of freedom. Each of them describes this micrometer-sized circuit. And as an aside, these were actually postulated half a year before quantum computing was first mentioned as a test bed for quantum mechanics on a macroscopic scale by Nobel laureate Tony Leggett. The achievement of our community is essentially that we went from the left to the right in 20 years. The left shows that the unique quantum properties manifest in these oscillations are persisting for one nanosecond. And the right shows you data where we go to 0 0.3 milliseconds. So this is uh, more than five orders of magnitude better coherence. And that we also went from kind of rudimentary experiments to something that looks and feels like a computer. On the bottom right are integrated computing systems. And on the top right, you see the interface that you use to program this for main time. So another achievement is, I think, that what we now have really feels like a computer. Uh, Unexpected partners we're working with. Now, I'm a theoretical physicist. I would have never thought that I work with uh, companies 
that help us to address the thing on the left. This is the cooling infrastructure that is needed to keep the device quantum coherent. It has an enormous and, if you want, beautiful amount of wires, but uh, if we get bigger and bigger, having a, uh, one or two wires per qubit is really too much. So we are now working in our new project with people I have never thought I would work before, namely engineers who make plugs and wiring systems, and also with software developers that make software that integrates quantum computers into classical computing ecosystems. Our big challenge is uh, to keep all of these many complex parts in sync and uh, keep them moving at the same time because the performance of the device is limited by its weakest point. The other thing I've shown you on the right, this is a um, coherence on the y-axis versus uh, time on the x-axis, and you see the five orders of magnitude improvement that I've mentioned to you, but you also see the curve ends in 2015, and uh, we need to have another uh, jump in coherence, so we need to do more materials research to make better qubits. That was a big uh, uh, insight into this uh, project, and now the next presentation is uh, by Rainer Blatt, who is uh, going to present the Munich uh, Quantum Valley. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the microphone. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will just briefly introduce myself and the work that we are doing before I come to the Munich Quantum Valley as advertised. So this is uh, quantum information science and quantum technologies being done at the Innsbruck University in conjunction with the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. And there's the four areas that we are covering right now. And I will just show you a few examples where we stand and what we have as chances and challenges in the future. The uh, workhorse that we have is an ion trap, which is essentially these four electrodes, which hold a linear string of ions at the center, which can be individually addressed, and they can take photographs, and these are the individual qubits that can be manipulated by uh, lasers that are sh um, shined on these uh, uh, in an addressed way. Now, what are we doing with these? We have a large uh, entangled quantum reg register, so we can really prove that they are entangled up to 24 ions, and we can make uh, universal quantum computations. Then we have scalable quantum algorithms, as we've shown here with the Shaw algorithm. We can produce logical qubits, and we can implement quantum error correction. The quantum metrology part is a smaller part in Innsbruck, but we'll hear more about that from PDB later. This is something that we are trying to do as well. We are trying to use quantum technologies to improve metrological experiments. But more to the point of quantum information processing is uh, the use for a quantum computer for quantum simulations. This is done with a, um, in an analog fashion, as you see here in the top picture, where we try to understand, say, materials behavior, or where we really try to solve, solve hard problems in quantum chemistry and lattice gauge theories with a digital quantum computer, as we've said uh, in demonstrator programs over the last years. And this is where the quantum computer lives, right next to the airport in Innsbruck, as you see here. And it's, of course, made in Tyrol by Alpine Quantum Technologies, who is now a company. And if you really want to buy one, we are ready that you can buy one this year, this in December. For the first time, we can offer that to you. If you really want to buy a quantum computer with up to 30, 40 qubits, just contact Thomas Mons on the right-hand side. He's the CEO. And you see, this is a very slim uh, two-inch. Uh, 19 inch racks, two 19 inch racks here side by side, one laser rack and one atom a rack with a control, and that's all there is. Again, proudly made in the Tyrol. But more to the point now, you see already this is the quantum computing engine uh, by AMO physics. It's slightly different from what we've seen before. It doesn't need any cooling power, but of course it needs cooling lasers, and the technology is ready to go. Just a few words about Munich Quantum Valley, since we heard about the German initiative here, and they are setting up now uh, under my coordination and guidance, uh, a number of experiments there in consortia and also in the joint uh, research work uh, where we start to do explorative directions, quantum communication to quantum matter and quantum simulation to quantum computing. And uh, this is now the seven partners that we have here, the universities uh, together with the uh, Max Planck Society and Fraunhofer Society and the Bavarian Academy of Sciences. What are we doing? We are doing this in three different projects. We have so-called lighthouse projects, which are just being advertised right now, and people can apply for that bottom, uh, bottom up. Uh, development of quantum computers is largely done top down by consortia, and they are already forming, and they have already their money since uh, the work started from the 1st of October this year. 
in the next five years, we are setting up also a quantum technology part, and of course, uh, there are activities in qualification and training as recruitment and outreach as well in this uh, program. Um, what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with three demonstrator platforms. This is uh, an Atom uh, qubit platform, which is guided by Manuel Bloch at the Machtbank for Quantum Optics. The iron qubits you've seen before, this is done uh, in the, uh, collaboration with AQT uh, that I've shown you before. And the superconducting qubits are being developed by Stefan uh, Philipp at the Technical University of Munich. With this, we have, of course, a large consortium right here, many companies are trying to gear up and to form uh, a real ecosystem in order to uh, create platforms within the next five years. And this is where we are going to be um, working on right now. Let me conclude with a few words on the chances and challenges, and this is maybe then a starting point later also for some discussions. The developer of an all-purpose quantum computer makes the use of laws of quantum mechanics, but it promises then, as you've seen, all of these three issues here. The difficulty will be that we have, um, of course, to, sc to, to scale the system up. But in the near future, I think we can develop quantum simulators that already tackle problems beyond classic computation. Whereas the long-term challenges still remain, we need quantum engineering to the point that we need engineers and companies to pitch in for micro technologies to achieve the scalability, also to develop more quantum algorithms. And uh, I think this is the key point in the future to really develop quantum error correction techniques and to implement them in larger systems as we have right now. You see right down at the bottom a string of already 50 ions that are currently being used in Innsbruck for this. And we can hopefully scale this up to beyond 100, even to 1,000. But all in all, the future is quantum. Thank you. Thank you. And now we continue with uh, Christine Silberhorn from the University of Paderborn. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. It's also a pleasure for me to represent the Photonics Quantum Computing Platform. My name is Christine Silberhorn. I'm located at Paderborn University, and there we are currently building up uh, the Institute for Photonic Quantum Systems, FOX. Now, here on that photograph, you already see how the hardware can look like. It's actually a photonic chip, and I want to be honest, this is one of the photonic chips we produce in our own labs, and probably it has to get smaller, but it gives you an impression how this will look in practice. Now, we have, and this is for the thing, the initiative of photonic quantum computing, and photonics is an important technology in Germany. Um, current efforts in Germany, although, do not only have this demonstrator system called Foquant, but we have further exploratory uh, projects, and we are very happy about that because we also have to get the technology running and to get really um, the challenges to get them done. One thing which is special on photonics, I would say, is that quantum photonics has demonstrated a quantum advantage. Um, that means that classical cannot compute the, classic, uh, the results already. Actually, the algorithm, I was involved when this was developed, uh, and you saw already this morning um, a talk by Zhuang Lu, where he showed this Chinese uh, processor, where they, it's based exactly on that technology. Now, if you look the situation in Germany, we are joining the expertise in industry and academia, and I think that's very important because we do need the technology there. Uh, and this unique combination of the multiplicity expertise is also a thing which distinguishes photonics here. The goal is to the implementation of a photonic quantum advantage and the implementation of a configurable quantum computer located in Germany. Now, I told you already about that, the quantum computation advantage, and I think I don't have to talk more about that because I guess many of you have heard. But um, let me mention that up to last year, photonics was considered probably not to be compatible. Now, this demonstration is a major effort, and you kind of see the picture here already. And it's an amazing technological achievement which has been done, and we want to go also this route because the concept we know very well, actually most of them were developed in Europe. Now, let me say a few words about photonic quantum computation. Um, for the specialists, it's always a little bit difficult to talk about photonics because photonic quantum computing is somehow different. Why? What is our qubits, what are the gates, and what are the metric? Well, typically all of our platforms have the qubit encoded in a matter system, and the light intermediates the interaction. Now for photonics, exactly the opposite. Our qubits are represented by light, meaning single photons, 
And the matter kind of, well, the gates are mediated by the matter. And while typically we are talking about state gate and measurement fidelities, for us, the biggest problem is not these measures, but it's loss in the system. Nevertheless, we can overcome all these challenges. So the computation is typically not circuit-based, but measurement-based. And I, maybe we come back to that point later on. Which are the partners? Um, this is from the demonstrator platform in your theory that they have a coordinator, which is really a, a company, Quant. Um, and uh, many other people are involved. And you're seeing that we are spread all over Germany here. But this is only part of the story. I told you that there's more people involved because there's also the other tele uh, uh, demonst um, development of these other uh, projects. And I think this is typical for photonics. We have a lot of expertise in Germany, which we really want to use. And we are really very widespread, and we are combining this expertise. So it's an exciting time here. Let me say a few terms about the near term and long term. Um, yes, I told you the demonstration of the quantum advantage is important. This will probably be useful for specific tasks. Um, it's also very important for us because it allows us to develop the technology, which means the circuitries. We need really very specific, very good circuitries which have to be developed. In the long term, we also aim for universal quantum computation where we can run a, a full algorithms. The, the uh, benefit we have is that we can have CMOS um, technology there, and this gives a unique scalability possibility because we can directly kind of use the technology which is also developed, for example, for telecommunication uh, uh, applications. But it's challenges, and this is probably more the five to ten years um, hor horizon. Let me say a few words. In Germany, we are building up the ecosystem at the moment, and there are strong players in academia and emerging in industry. See? I think the high degree of the synergy between industry and academia is needed. But let's be honest, in the international competition, Photonics is really also identified as one of the platforms. I don't comment on that, but you see the number of mo money which is spent currently in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we continue with Keith Schmidt from the uh, Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, the German Metrology Institute. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a warm welcome also from my side. I'm uh, from PDB, the German National Metrology Institute and Leibniz University in Hanover. So our uh, favorite qubit system is based on trapped ions that Rainer has already introduced and saved me some time in preparing my slides. Um, I'll just briefly list some of the technological advantages that we believe to have in that uh, specific uh, qubit platform. We have a, an all-to-all -all connectivity, we have coherence times demonstrated by the community of uh, many minutes, uh, the gate times are microseconds, uh, the gate errors are below a percent, uh, even for two qubit gates. Uh, the traps that at least we use here in our um, consortium are based on standard chip processing techniques and um, there are even useful algorithms already demonstrated, so in a way a quantum advantage. This is actually my area of expertise, it's called quantum logic spectroscopy, so we uh, develop small quantum algorithms to make clocks better and uh, to improve spectroscopy. Now, uh, what are the challenges in uh, this specific field? Um, it's scalability that has been mentioned a couple of times already, uh, scaling to thousands of uh, qubits while maintaining the exquisite control that we have over a handful of these ions already, um, and to make the operations even better than they are right now, because we need, in the end, we will need for a fully programmable quantum computer error correction, and um, for this, all operations need to have an error less than uh, 10 to the minus 4. Now, our approach to achieve uh, or to, to meet this challenge is uh, the so-called quantum CCD approach, where you have one or several chips, uh, where you can shuttle the ions around on the surface and then bring them together in different registers, as you know it from uh, standard uh, uh, microprocessors. Um, one technological challenge that we have to solve here is to integrate electronics on chip because otherwise uh, we have at least as many wires as uh, we heard from uh, Frank. 
Um, and uh, also, um, we need uh, integrated photonics yeah, uh, to address all the, um, uh, the to provide laser cooling and, and readout of, of the qubit system in the end. Now, our vision uh, within the next five years or so is to have a 50 qubit quantum processor uh, near the error correction threshold, so with errors less than uh, on, the, or on the order of 10 to the minus 4, and uh, that we have demonstrated or required technology to scale up the system uh, to well beyond 100 qubits in the end. And uh, we also want to uh, make first steps towards a uh, supply chain for quantum computing hardware and uh, to set everything up uh, to have essentially companies uh, that provide you with all the required components to actually set up such a machine. And what we also want to do is we want to commercialize spillover uh, technologies. The comp uh, before a true quantum computer um, is available and uh, can demonstrate useful applications, we believe that way before that um, we can, for example, build microscopes based on uh, nano and micro integrated LEDs, the same technology that we use to address our ions on chip. Uh, we can build using the same chip technology um, atom interferometers, and we can build optical clocks. And here, what you see here is a, a first demonstrator that this already works. It's the OptiClock project funded by the BMBF. It's a two inch uh, or a 19 inch two racks, <laughs> same mistake again. <laughs> 19 inch two racks, um, fully integrated. It uh, runs autonomously. And the uh, technology that we've de developed for this transportable optical clock will come into use in our quantum computing system and the technology development uh, that we have on the quantum computer uh, will then go back into the quantum sensing area as well, similarly. And uh, so here are the partners. Uh, this all is embedded into the uh, Quantum Valley Lower Saxony that we have, uh, that has been initiated uh, last fall. Um, the funding of 25 million euros from the state of Lower Saxony has started uh, 1st of January this year uh, with um, many local partners and uh, now recently, as the others as well, uh, we have submitted a proposal to build a quantum computing demonstrator um, where Christian Osbekaus, who I think is in the room, um, uh, takes the lead and we're collaborating with very many companies that I would not have imagined uh, we'd, we'd be working with, um, which was quite um, uh, an exciting and, and also a stimulating experience for us. And uh, my last slide is open questions. Uh, that's similar to Rainer's last slide. Is uh, There are several open questions that uh, I think we should address in this open, open discussion here. How far can we go? How fast do we have all the people we need for that? Uh, which problems can we solve efficiently? Will NISC devices that we currently have even be useful in the end? And uh, are there actually useful quantum algorithms beyond Shaw and Grover? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, last but certainly not least is uh, Oliver Ambacher from the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Solid State Physics in Freiburg. Yeah, we are playing with magnets. So you see here, that's our quantum computer. We are turning one magnet and the other follow because we see dipole-dipole interaction and you see they have a special relation. If the one red is on the top, the next, the green is on the top. So there's a kind of entanglement. Um, what you can see is if we can turn one of the magnets into the axis where the other are turned around, we can couple and decouple the magnets. And because the magnets we are playing with are too big, to, go, to perform fast information processing, we take the electron spins and the nuclear spins, which we can embed into diamond. Diamond is a good host crystal because it's so solid, it's so stiff, so it protects the spins from the environment. So at the moment, we are dealing with 10 spins at the time, and because an electron spin creates a, a magnetic field of one Tesla to a nuclear spin, which is only one nanometer apart, we can decide in which direction the nuclear spin is turning around by just flopping the electron spin from, pot, from the bottom to the top. Then we address these spins by radio frequency microwaves, and you see how these spins are turning around. And if you just 
look at the pink arrow from the right and from the left side, you see we can turn it in a controlled way by 90 degrees and just by turning the green spin, the, the electron spin, we can decide the direction of this turn by 90 degrees. And that is actually a, a two qubit quantum gate, which we are uh, realizing that way. And we have a lot of these turning magnets already, which we can control and uh, up to 10 qubits. And what we are doing by programming is that we use these gates to turn the spins in a controlled way and that's what we call at the moment programming. So to upscale our quantum computing capacity we have to uh, entangle these 10 qubits to other 10 qubits and that is, will be performed by diamonds and that is our ambition for the next five years to go up to 100 qubits which are entangled. What you can buy is already a room temperature working system based on diamond from quantum brilliance with 10 qubits, as I said, working at room temperature. For benchmarking and for learning, we are operating an IBM quantum computer, which is located close to Stuttgart at the moment with 27 qubits and a quantum volume of 64. The good thing of this computer is that the gates are really fast, although the coherence time of the qubits is not the best, so that we can, let's say, manipulate one qubit with 200 gates up to, yeah, that's the highest number we can perform. So what we are, what we would like to contribute to the future ecosystem is different kind of processor with different advantages for different kind of applications because we think there will be not the one quantum computer at least not in the next five to ten years. And what is our vision? That's only one example of one of our partners. He would like to optimize the operation of the 300,000 trucks operating in, in Germany to a point where the navigation is optimized for all the trucks, including the packages they have to deliver. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So now we start with the panel discussion and we will alternate questions from me with potential questions from the audience, but let's start with one question from me. So we are all, I think, public sector uh, employees, and we have all mentioned companies in various contexts. So who will deliver the quantum computer? Will it be a public sector entity? Will it be a quantity? Are companies and public sector competitors, or how is their relation? Anybody wants to start about uh, this public-private partnership? Rainer. If you want, I can start with that one. I personally am convinced that at this time, we need this very strong collaboration. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not just technology. So it's not like having a company that is developing a certain material technology to the point that you can just uh, then produce big quantum computers in the near future. We can go with technology only so far to solve a certain problem. If you really want to go beyond, we have to resort to physics. And that really makes the progress. And this is usually done then in institutions at universities or research institutes like Max Planck, Fraunhofer or Helmholtz, I don't care. But in any case, so we need a joint venture for this. So I'm convinced for the next five to 10 years, it is a close collaboration of all these. And we still have to learn quite a bit from each other because physicists usually don't understand much about engineering. And uh, our engineers, I'm sorry to say this, usually don't understand very much about quantum physics. And this is the other ecosystem that we have to generate. Mm -hmm. Any other views on this, uh, Christine? Yeah, I'm happy also to answer. Thanks for this, Ryan. I fully agree. Uh, I think for the quantum photonics uh, demonstrator platform, it's quite interesting because it's an industry which is leading there. And it's pretty clear because photonics, we really need extremely good technology. And we have to develop technology which is actually expensive. If you look at these things, and also you saw the international competitors, we need fabs. We need really the, the private sector in there. But I fully agree, if you look at the quantum side and you want to optimize the things, this is on the one on the engineering side, but then you have to develop still the ideas, and I think this is so fascinating as a scientist. So this is really at the forefront where we have to put all these different things together. So we definitely need this collaboration, and I would like to say that the universities also have to be strong. They are currently, but this is also why I'm here. Um, I think we need both. Mm -hmm. 
I fully agree. Yeah, I think uh, we need uh, the the synergies to draw on the synergies between uh, basic science and the engineering that, in part, also industry uh, can provide. A particular uh, aspect here is, in 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 my point of view, that uh, of course we we get public funding currently, but it can only go for so long. Eventually there needs to be a product, whether that's after five, 10, or 20 years, that, that's a different question. So we need to stimulate that transition from basic research into industry that can provide a sustainable ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? We bought a quantum computer. It was really expensive from IBM, only for a certain time of five years, several tens of million. And the disadvantage is that a company like IBM the business model is to provide this computer within a cloud. So there would be a kind of dependence on IBM and the operation of the system, and we would not have a complete control about the data which are simulated with a quantum computer. So the real big quantum computer, I think the duty has to transfer to the industry, the users, like the big chemical industry, automotive, um, because we do not have really a, a producer of all parts of the quantum computer yet. Maybe for smaller systems, but for the bigger system, I think it, reals, it needs a real big investment in companies like the one from Rainer Blatt to scale it up, yeah, very fast and very good, or it needs a combination of uh, industry partners, which could do part of the production and they can buy other parts, parts, but that will take at least five to eight years to be there, and it needs a lot of investment, which is not accessible yet. Thank you. So playing on the theme, I mean, I think what you mentioned is kind of, uh, we're working like the Apollo program, where NASA built their spaceships, and uh, uh, the IBM quantum computer is already the era of SpaceX. Huh? Um, so, um, a little bit because we are now on this pivotal moment uh, that uh, the German, the big German program has started to run and we have actually all built our public-private partnerships and by this also tried to match the community in Germany with the expectations of the government. Did you feel that this was a good match? Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to start? Let me say no, but um, <laughs> we, we, we can talk about this later. Because what you said first is um, that uh, you talked about NASA and mm -hmm. that approach. That approach is actually being pursued right now by DLR. And we have, but we are lacking the companies in, 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 in Germany and in Europe that actually could embark on that, like Elon Musk and you know, the, the companies that now produce the spaceships. So I think this is, for, for the next time, for the foreseeable future, we need really a strong collaboration to, to, to get there. In the end, I fully agree with what Oliver said, we need companies to produce it in the end. And uh, finally, this is out of the hands of the, of the universities. And the universities will have to come up with fundamental things and, and more research here. But for the government point that you just mentioned, let me put it that way to be friendly. It could have been done better, but everything could have been done better. So it was a first try, unfortunately, it's the only drive for two billion euros. Ah, it sucks. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, it, 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 it's a good start. It could have been done better. And I think we actually need, need better instruments yeah, for, for funding these type of activities. Yeah. Uh, simply because uh, the, the, the 2 billion euro uh, quantum technologies activity has been implemented with old instruments that were not properly suited for such a large endeavor, for such a mm -hmm. moonshot goal, essentially. Yeah. And so we, we certainly need new instruments that, uh, that address the, the open issues and bring together, uh, s synthesize the DLR approach with uh, the uh, basic science-driven approach, uh, that we can unite all aspects, that we can have um, private sector funding um, by buying certain components from them, uh, paired with public sector funding for uh, translating uh, fundamental research into industry. I think that, that those instruments we need to develop. I now talk to myself for a minute, uh, because I'm the moderator and also an occasional panelist. So one thing that uh, one thing that uh, I have um, observed um, uh, in 
is, I mean, we are now at the transition point from small science, small projects, everybody in their lab or small teams to big science, to accelerator scale science. We are somewhat on that way. And I think the difficulty was to match how we organize ourselves at that very moment. We are not certain yet, but we are also not everybody in their own lab anymore. The other observation I have made is that in Germany, we have a fantastic ecosystem of high-tech tool makers. For almost every component of the quantum computer, we have qualified people. The main challenge is to put it all together and to have uh, people in front to kind of call the shots and address the whole machine. This is at least true in our area. I don't know whether others felt the same. And now I'm back to moderator. <laughs> I'd like just to add one more thing. Um, we have here also a problem in, from the society in general. We are not very strong in VC money. We, we kind of tend not to want to use this, these instruments. And if you say it could have been done better, yes, maybe. But it's also to have really this pri massive private investment we need. There's not a big culture there. And I think this is what we are lacking at the moment. And maybe also from the scientist side, we're not so much used to go this route. So I think it could be a role model here, and it's a real chance where we can try. Well, it's not over. We are starting only. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody wants to add something to this? I, I think Christine puts her finger into the wound. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have, in, in Europe in general, and in Germany in particular, in particular, a very conservative investment culture. Let's put it that way. Yeah? In, in the US, uh, People invest uh, multi-million dollars into companies, into several companies, startup companies. If just one wins, that takes it all in mm -hmm. the end. That makes it worth uh, having invested in 50 uh, before. And that culture we do not have. And th this is why we often come late in Europe. Uh, and the IT, all the IT development over the 20, uh, last 20 years is a, is a good example that in this society, this, this has failed and we need we need to change that somehow. I think that's definitely true, but I think the, the, the question that he asked was more, what is the funding situation? What could have been done better? Mm. And I have to say, uh, and uh, the, what I learned over the last three quarters of a year, even last year or so, is you, you want to spend a few hundred million, if not two billion of money, and break it down to 400 euro bills or 800 euro bills. Come on, where are we? This is not how things are done. And uh, I've been leading a um, consortia that were paid out of American money. They are much more forgiving. They're talking to you once. They want to see is he or she able to deliver or not. If you're given a million, just do it. And if you're not delivering, you're not getting a second chance. That's fine. And so we have to come up with better instruments. We talked about this early on, and we tried to convince them. And this is my only, uh, yeah allegation to the politicians. You could have thought about this earlier than that, because we told you, and they didn't. OK, so be okay. it. Be a physicist, we can adapt to the situation. We will make the best out of it, I'm sure. But Maybe let me throw in one nugget before we go to audience questions and then have a final round. The nugget would be, you already mentioned that we need to work together with engineers and companies. And uh, we physicists tend to underestimate engineering and vice versa. So how do the ideal quantum engineers and also the quantum aware society of the future look like? And how do we get there? Because I think we also all have a recruiting bottleneck right now. I think it would be great if the groups which are going for the demonstrator are as open as possible to the others to provide access, to mm -hmm. provide exchange of information to reduce the risk for the industry because they will be careful also in five years, even if you complain, to reduce the risk for the industry as good as we can so that at a certain point they will jump in. Mm -hmm. So in terms of people and society, people working with us, people using our tools and people <coughs> understanding our tools, uh, how do we get there? So I, I think people are certainly a bottleneck these mm -hmm. days. Yeah, um, if, if you calculate how many people you can employ for two um, billion euros, that's a lot of people that simply do not exist worldwide who would have the expertise. And so I think uh, this is a, a long-term problem that we cannot solve over the uh, next uh, couple of years. We have to start essentially in kindergarten already, Yeah, make them technology aware, uh, not only for uh, quantum physics, uh, but also for, for other technologies. 
And uh, what, what we have to do is uh, we have to try to, uh, to give the, the, the young people a, a vision of what we can do, how fascinating the field is, and then teach them the right skill set, um, engineering and physics, yeah? not, not just fundamental mm -hmm. physics, but also the engineering part is very important. And how to make money with it. <laughs> Let me comment on that. I actually think school is a good buzzword here. We have to change the curricula. And actually, I started to do that more than 20 years ago. The way we teach quantum physics, I hear a lot, oh, there's all this spooky thing. No, it's not. It should be by now, it's a 100 years old theory. It should be a normal thing that also somebody who is not an engineer who is doing humanities knows what the quantum is. It's probably a dream, but as soon as it has entered the society from the bottom, you will also find that engineers start to do that. And I agree, but up to the point we have it there, we have to be extremely open, and we have to really also mm -hmm. go for it and try and make an impact there. My dream is always that people have a good public understanding of probability theory <laughs> on the same level as they are forced to learn poems by heart. I think on this we could firmly build. And um, is there questions from the audience uh, to the panelists? Yes, please. I have to apologize. I am uh, ignorant in all these technologies. But what I understood from this that there are a number of technologies competing each other. And uh, the scale is much larger than in the classical semiconductor silicon-based technologies. So the question would be, for me, one question. How do you ensure the interoperability of these technologies ultimately if it comes to final products? That's one question. Second issue is, if, if I understood correctly, this is only referring to the processors, not to the memories. So if, uh, so the, 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 because the access time to memories is also critical in my view. Mm -hmm. or for building up the whole system. But again, I am ignorant, so I would expect your answer, how it looks. Can I begin and just answer the first and second question in mm -hmm. that order? The first question was about the size of these things. First of all, <coughs> think about the, uh, with a reasonable application later on, we will need maybe hundred thousands, maybe a million of qubits. We will never use gigacubits or terakubits, this is beyond anything that we need for now. If you really want to make a big difference, we need maybe 100,000, that would be fantastic. You already can tackle problems with a few 50, say a few hundred, even a thousand qubits. So you don't need that big machines. Then, of course, the further the development goes, you can downsize systems. So that they will have the same size as a mainframe today. Second question is, uh, this was about uh, uh, memory. Memory, yes. Uh, the, uh, memory is necessary for short memories for, for s certain systems, like for a quantum repeater and things like that. You don't need a massive memory. It would be good to have that quantum memory too for other reasons, but the usual algorithms that we have right now don't need that quantum memory, at least, at least not in, in large senses. And if you have implemented quantum error correction, you've solved that problem too. Anybody wants to add something on this? I, I think the question was also about uh, which type of hardware platform yeah, which, uh, mm -hmm. is winning. Yeah? So uh, in an ideal world, and, and I, I still think that's probably true, yeah, there will be room for everybody because um, the hardware platforms differ so strongly from their specifications that uh, you, uh, there's the hope that you can solve certain problems with... Um, different hardware platforms, so that that each platform has has its killer application, so to speak. I think that that is one of the ideas behind it. Maybe let me add one thing. There might be completely new formats appearing, like cloud quantum computing. This is long term, but there could be a security which you can't imagine at the moment. I think <laughs> this is part of the fascination, which adds to the different platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think interoperable. Yeah, I think so we've seen the history of classical computing that the hardware platform has changed. We have started with mechanical gears, and um, I think it's important that we do enough research to let the laws of nature determine what is the best one and not uh, you know, how we do it. So we have uh, under three minutes left, so everybody has about 30 seconds. 
to express, uh, and I'll starting with Oliver and I end, um, to express um, what do you expect would be the first area where quantum advantage um, will actually be visible to humankind, and if you're daring, when? I think it will be in the field of quantum chemistry, because if the quantum computer is doing something wrong, it doesn't hurt that much. You can mm -hmm. tolerate certain degrees of fault, and you can become more and more complex in the quantum chemistry process by upscaling the hardware with the software for the certain problem. And I would guess in five years, more than a hydrogen atom can be simulated. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, we already have quantum advantage. Um, quantum logic spectroscopy is a good example. <laughs> so we can build clocks that we could not build without uh, simple quantum algorithms, but more, uh, uh, yeah, less humorously, maybe, uh, I think along the same lines that uh, quantum simulation, uh, materials research, um, that is a bit more forgiving than a fully error-tolerant quantum algorithm uh, is probably the first application in for example, designing new drugs, um, new materials, finding out how superconductivity works. I think these are examples where we'll, we'll first hit the ground, I think. I find it extremely hard on my predictions, and i kind of refuting to do it. If you're talking about quantum advantage, quantum supremacy, we do have it. So from the fundamental point of view, we have demonstrated that we can do things which are classically inaccessible. Now, you were, this is not what you have asked. You have to ask what is really where will we see it. My guess would be, at least for the platform I'm familiar with, is an optimization problems, logistics, something like that. Um, and then it's a definition, what you call quantum advantage. You might want to use a quantum computer, so you could use a classical computer, but it would be slower. So I have 36 seconds left, minus what you want to do. Quantum simulations was mentioned. It's going to break even very soon. Uh, some people have already achieved quantum advantage here, but this is going to be the first application in basic physics. I think that's my projection. And then chemistry, whatever, could come in as long as we can control more qubits. Okay, uh, so I'm answering my own question. I hope I have a good answer. Um, I believe that in about 10 years, people will, we will see chemical processes that have been designed with the help of quantum computers. And we will see that in optimization and logistics, people are using quantum computers because they actually use less energy than an equally powerful classical computer. And um, we will also, and this is now the concluding world, um, uh, concluding word, uh, before I, th let me first thank all the panelists. Let's thank Falling Walls for making this possible. And, um, um, as a concluding word, uh, this is about uh, breaking walls and falling walls, and I think we have heard before how quantum physics is often viewed to be mysterious and difficult because we often try to retrace uh, the steps of their, its inventors. But there's a new generation of scientists that it used if playing with computers, that is used with programming, that have a fresh view on how they look at complex system. So I think uh, with the technological development driven by practical reasons, there will also be a new understanding and we are going to kind of break the wall to a quantum aware society. Thank you very much panelists. Thank you very much audience, also remote and falling walls. And we have slightly overrun, uh, but uh, I would now like to close the session.